In this video, we'll discuss sample dilution in assays, specifically ELISAs. We'll go over when a dilution factor may be applied, dilution terminology, how these factors are used in analysis, and we'll also go over an example. Samples are often diluted for two main reasons. If the result of the unknown falls outside the range of the curve, the concentration result will be incalculable and will return a flagged result, or in this case, greater than curve limit. Note this is a direct ELISA. If you're working with a competitive ELISA and the direction of the curve is switched, samples too concentrated may return a less than curve designation. For samples with results that cannot be calculated, these have y-axis results, in this case blank corrected, outside the asymptotes of the curve. This example uses a 4PL curve, a commonly used fit method in biological assays. Other curve methods may be in use, but we'll discuss the 4PL curve fit as it's widely used in ELISAs. For a 4PL fit, the y values of the asymptotes of the curve are represented by the a and d parameters. So for this example, you can see the blank corrected value for unknown 1 is 1.94550, 1 and this is greater than the d parameter 1.73743. Looking at the chart, we can see that as the y-axis value increases, the x-axis value also increases, meaning the result for unknown 1 is too concentrated to be measured. By diluting this sample, we may be able to bring the result back within the reportable range of the curve. Another reason samples may be diluted is if the result of the unknown sample is calculable within the asymptotes of the curve, but outside the results of the standard samples. For these results, the concentration is extrapolated as opposed to interpolated. This means the curve fit equation was used to return the concentration, however there is not a standard sample on both sides of the unknown to confirm the reported result. Each laboratory will define their own acceptance criteria for specific assays, so it may be that a certain degree of extrapolation is permitted, for example no more than 15%, but for this example we'll use the criteria that any samples with extrapolated results should be reassayed for confirmation. Looking at this example a little closer, you can see on the curve chart that unknown one is at the very top of the chart, with no additional standard following this unknown sample. The blank corrected value 1.64550 is greater than the highest standard value of 1.6205. So although the concentration result is calculable, it is always preferable to report interpolated results, or results that fall within the range of the standards. So once we've identified cases where samples should be diluted, next let's discuss dilution terminology. There are two ways to refer to sample dilutions, and they can be a little bit confusing as the way they're written is very similar. First, the dilution ratio nomenclature. This is written in terms of S to D, where S is parts of sample and D is parts of diluent. Add the parts together to find the total units of volume. The second option is the dilution factor nomenclature. This is written in terms of S to T, where S is the parts of sample and T is the total volume. Let's look at a couple of examples for how these two options can be used in practice. So we need to identify the dilution factor, which will be used in subsequent calculations to return the final concentration. If the dilution ratio is used, and the protocol calls for a 1 to 4 dilution, we could dilute our sample 100 microliters of sample into 400 microliters of diluent, because remember, the first number in the ratio represents the part's sample, and the second represents the part's diluent. To calculate the dilution factor, we need to find the total parts divided by the part's sample. So S plus D, or 1 plus 4, divided by the part's sample, or 1, is 5 divided by 1, returning a dilution factor of 5. If the dilution factor nomenclature is used, and the protocol calls for a 1 to 5 dilution, we could again dilute our sample 100 microliters of sample into 400 microliters of diluent, because this first number represents the part sample, and the second number represents the total parts. To calculate the dilution factor, we need to divide the total parts by the part sample, so this would again be 5 divided by 1, or a dilution factor of 5. The bottom line? The dilution factor is equal to the final volume divided by the initial sample volume. So by reviewing the volumes used in the dilution, you can always calculate the appropriate dilution factor regardless of which nomenclature is used to describe the dilution. Okay, so now we've identified the samples to dilute and have calculated their dilution factors. How is this applied to the data analysis? 
Dilution factors are used to calculate the final concentration. The concentration obtained by the standard curve using the diluted sample is multiplied by the dilution factor to obtain a final concentration. So let's say we have a sample diluted times 5, meaning the dilution factor is 5. Applying this formula, the obtained concentration is 125. So 125 multiplied by the dilution factor of 5 returns a final concentration of 625. Let's look at an example. This is the same sample we discussed in our previous example, where the concentration result is calculable, however, it falls outside the range of the standards. I've diluted this sample times 5, so the dilution factor will be entered as 5, and I've received a new blank corrected value of 0.688. Now you'll notice 0.688 is not one-fifth of the originally received y-axis value 1.6455, and that's because of the sigmoidal nature of the curve. So we want to reanalyze this data because now the blank corrected value does fall within the range of the standards, and we're looking to confirm our previously received concentration result of approximately 365. So reviewing the updated values for unknown 1, you can see the new blank corrected value or y-axis value falls well within the reportable range of the curve and standards. Looking at the curve, you can see the range in which unknown 1 falls is essentially in the middle of the standards, with that blank corrected value being between standards 3 and 4. We can see the obtained concentration, 72.8601, matches the expected obtained concentration falling between standards 3 and 4. By applying a dilution factor of 5, the obtained concentration is multiplied by 5 to return the final concentration of 364.3, which is quite close to the original concentration of 364.618. So by diluting and reassaying this sample, you can confidently report the value of 364.3, a value that was interpolated as opposed to extrapolated. One more item to note, if your sample has been run neat or undiluted, the appropriate dilution factor to enter is 1. This will multiply the concentration obtained from the standard curve by a value of 1, or in other words, an undiluted sample. I've performed these analyses using our desktop data analysis software, MyAssays Desktop, but we have several different tools available for analyzing data. For more information, please see the link in the description. If you have any questions about diluting samples, how to calculate the appropriate dilution factor, or performing your data analysis, please email us at support at myassays.com.